All right, with no further ado, Dr. Robert White, he's professor in the history department here at UCF. Okay. Okay, um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Eric and, uh, and the director for the invite to, uh, to talk to uh, your class about uh, the topic at hand. I feel very fortunate to, uh, to discuss this. I want to thank my students who, who are here from uh, Caribbean Studies, uh, Caribbean History and Culture, and the class uh, uh, 20th Century American History uh, to, uh, to come. I know, I know this is not their time, because we have our class later on in the day, but they, they decided to come, and I thank you uh, for that. Now, all of you know something about the Trevon Martin case. I mean, for a while, it was the number one topic uh, in the media. We're going to look at some specifications in reference to the analytical approaches that we should be viewing and to how we should see this. Now, oftentimes, before I, uh, um, I, I do a book or article or a presentation, I always dedicate it to my son uh, because our children are the ones, hopefully, we'll find a better world, or at least we will help to create a better world for them so that they don't have to deal with this bigotry, racism, and other types of isms that we have in our society. That's why I call it the so-called United States, uh, because if it was completely united, we would not have all the isms and the hostilities and the bigotry that we confront today. My son is vibrant Leslie Santos White III. We took this picture at the old uh, courthouse downtown. You have to visit. It's a nice uh, history center now. Now, where do we go with this? Oftentimes, when we look at civil rights and human rights, we take it as, a, as something new. Very seldom, especially for your generation, do we have people who are brought up within the movement. I was brought up within the movement. My father was the head of the NAACP in Delaware for several years. And being part of that movement at this time, I've, I experienced firsthand of the elements of hostile racism. I remember a cross being burned on our front yard. Many of you have never seen this or only, only, only heard about it uh, on television or in some other media. My father was a, a militant member of the NAACP. Not that he goes around burning up and doing things like that, but he was more aggressive. And you find out that many Africans or people of African descent who are from the Caribbean or Central America or South America oftentimes have a much more aggressive element and less tolerant perspective towards racism as many people who live within the confines of the laws of the United States. He was a product of the Marcus Garvey School of Resistance, that is black pride, self-help, independence. There were other people like him that come along that was in other parts of the country, um, such as um, uh, Robert Williams out of Monroe, North Carolina. Now, Robert Williams, probably one of the most forceful spokespersons for civil rights and human rights, was very, very important. In 1958, 1959, in Monroe, North Carolina, when the KKK said that they were going to go into the black community and beat people and pillage the community and rape, he, along with some young people, as well as his wife, met them as they were entering and said, not today. You're not going to come in our community and cause any ruckus. I would encourage you to read his book. It's titled Negroes with Guns. Now, you may ask, why am I going way back? in reference to looking at uh, Trevon Martin. Because the Trevon Martin element and the Trevon Martin uh, issue is something that is historical. You have to look at the pillars and the blocks that brought us today with Trevon Martin. You have to look at what took place in the past. So therefore, people like militant uh, heads like Robert Williams said that, listen, there's a new approach. And that new approach is that there's going to be some element of resistance, some element of pride, some element of strength that to go along with the general, general concept 
a nonviolence. One other person that uh, that's oftentimes that's not put in the context is Malcolm X. Now Malcolm X, he follows right up from Robert Williams. Everyone knows about Malcolm X, ah, any means necessary. I see kids have it on on their hats, their shirts, any means necessary. I'm down with your brother. What does it mean? Where does he go with this? Malcolm X also focused on resistance, all right, fighting back. He was a proponent for militant and aggressive approaches to change the issue of civil rights to human rights so that human rights would be extended to the larger community. Now, when we talk about human rights, we cannot talk about it without looking at Mahatma Gandhi. He is the founder for 20th century thought on this. This small man, 5'2", maybe 110 pounds, from India, created the philosophy that is all people are given basic rights regardless to their race, regardless to their ethnicity, regardless to their nationality, their religion, language, all people have a basic right to live in this society. And he goes along with this, and he, and he, and he creates a movement that begins to filter through other parts of the world. Now, when it comes to the United States, we can't we can't look at, we cannot look at human rights without looking at America's greatest black intellectual of the 20th century. That is W.E.B. Du Bois, finishing from Harvard University with a PhD, finishing from Fisk University, the best black school at the time. Now the importance of Du Bois is that he is very prophetic with his review. That is, not only is he important, in the development of the first civil rights movement, the Niagara movement, not only is he important to the development of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, but for his simple statement. That is, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. He said this in 1903. And sadly, he is right. Not only was it the problem of the 20th century, as we focus and live in the 21st century, it is still the problem. You can't get away from it, and no one wants to deal with it, but Du Bois did. Now, looking at how the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line, we can see that the first 25 years of race activism and hostility towards the blacks would be very, very confrontational and hostile. We call it the red hot summer of 1920, but it's really the red hot decade. Just look at our own backyard. How many of you have been to Okoye? No one, I guess you don't travel too often. You don't leave, you don't need the confines of uh, UCF too much. But what, it's maybe 35 miles from here? Had one of the worst riots, all right? Uh, when I say riots, that's a bad term. It was one of the worst massacres against black people in the history of our country. Black people whole and wholesale was massacred. Whole communities were destroyed. Let's go a little bit farther. 1923, Rosewood. I took my classes to Rosewood last year. All right? It's not too far from here. And it was a, it was a wonderful community a self-enterprising community, an independent community, a community that features some of the best in black America, all right? But because of racism, hostility, anger, and also what Robert Weeby would say in his manuscript, the search for order to keep black people suppressed, the whole community was destroyed. If you go there today, there's nothing, nothing. A whole community destroyed, and we're still counting the number of people who were killed by this. Let's go on. Now, if that's, not, if that's not bad enough, let's take 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma, the most affluent black community in the country at the time. Tulsa, Oklahoma, the black Wall Street, had hospitals, had banks, had banker, uh, bakeries, it had an affluent 
self-enterprising black, middle, and upper, upper class black community. But again, because of hostility and because of a, an, a, an element that blacks should be suppressed and kept in their place, the whole a district was bombed. And I'm not talking about somebody putting some Molotov cocktails and throwing some, you know Molotov cocktails? Okay, I just want to make sure. I'm in the right generation. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Molotov cocktails. We're talking about real military army bombs destroying a community. No one talks about this. We talk about all. Oh, there's a bombing in Oklahoma in, in the 1990s. There's this and that going on. We don't look what took place. Let us go on. All right. Chicago based riot, 1919. I love Chicago. I used to live in Chicago. Many of you know Chicago because that's the home of Obama. But that place was a, a very segregated place. A whole community was destroyed again. Hundreds of blacks were killed again. Now, why was this? You have a case whereby a young black boy on the South Shore, Lake Shore, swimming in the, swimming in the lake, crossed the unimaginary line, uh, imaginary line, and whites threw bottles and bricks and things at him that killed him. All right? And it wasn't enough to kill him. They had to go through the community to attack black Americans. Harlem race riot, 1935. What's the case there? Harlem, everybody loves Harlem, you know, the cotton club and all of this type of thing. Excitement. But it was a place, even though it was called the cultural capital of the world, it was a place also that featured a, a tremendous amount of black hosti uh, white hostility towards blacks, police brutality, and that type of thing. A young black kid allegedly went into a store. He allegedly stole a pocket knife or a switchblade. Whites go after him, beat him, creates a riot, and it creates a massacre on Harlem that lasts for over five days. How about Jasper? Jasper, Texas, 1993. That's, very, that's not very long ago. These the little circles there. What happens? Young black man's walking, picked up. Um, and, 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 and uh, kidnapped, essentially, by a mob of whites that was on a pickup, hog ties him. What's a hog tie? Anybody, uh, farmers? Hog tie him, connect the road to the pickup, and drag him miles on asphalt. The circles represent where parts of his body fell off. All right, that's not long ago. Let us continue. All right. Now, these things are not just taking place. They're still taking place. I mean, we, we, I, I, I get information all the time, all right? Little things, strange death, a strange uh, uh, hanging in Mississippi a couple of years ago, all right? Black man uh, with his hands behind his back and handcuffs, killed by the policeman. Police said he, he shot himself. Things like this. We still talk about, we still have this type of activity. Now, as this is going on, this would create a movement, all right, again, towards militancy for civil and human rights. Now, all of this, some of this movement would be in a backdrop of the 1950s. How is that? 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Someone said, what, what happened? Quickly. This, this is civil rights class, isn't it? All right, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. The Supreme Court argues that segregation is not legal in the United States. It's unconstitutional. We thought it would create a better society. But in that backdrop, you have a young kid named Emmett Till from Chicago, goes to Muddy Water, Mississippi. He brags about how he has white friends in, in Chicago. One of his cousins says to him, well, if you have white friends, you're not afraid of white people, I dare you to say something to that white lady in the store. He says something to her. That night, Klansmen go to his house, pick him up, beat him, kill him till he's unrecognized. This is a black backdrop. All of this would create a movement towards human rights. Please go on a second. Now, as we look at the movement towards human rights, let us look at now the case to two individuals at hand. All right? The media, the storyline, you know better than I. Young man from Miami visits 
his family in Sanford. He's walking, buys some Skittles, walks home. He's confronted by another gentleman, all right? A gentleman who has some other issues, all right? Asking questions. Why are you walking here? In his mind. Why are you looking suspicious? What is that? May I, maybe I should approach you or stop you. That's the issues that's taking place. Now, more specifically, let's go on a second and, and identify who is Mr. George Zimmerman, all right? And who is Trevor Martin? Now, George Zimmerman had a whole host of different identifications, all right? But for sure, he comes from a solid middle-class family. Father's a magistrate out of Jersey. He comes, he's married, all right? Now, it comes up that he's Hispanic. I put it this way. He's Hispanic when he wants to be, <laughs> when it's convenient, all right? Before that, he wasn't Hispanic, all right? He just, so, but now when, when the press starts to look at him, his father comes up and says, oh, on CNN, he's Hispanic. We have a multicultural uh, family. Well, listen to me. Just because he calls himself Hispanic does not mean that he does not have a race issue. All right? Now, you have to go back. You have to take my class now. <laughs> All right? And that is in, 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 in the Caribbean, in South America, in Central America, there's a race problem. No denying. As my class learns, that there was more slaves going to Central and South America and to places as the Caribbean and Cuba and Brazil than to the United States. Brazil, Brazil just enacted a policy of, a, uh, of affirmative action. In all these countries, you have race issues. So just to say, oh, I'm Hispanic, doesn't mean anything. All right? We have to look a little bit deeper uh, with that. Now, we see that he takes on the role, not as being Hispanic, but being a white member of society with privilege. That's what it's all about. Now, who is Trevor Martin? Trevor Martin is just about any black man in the country. What do you mean by that? Here's something. It's been reported that but before the age of 70, over 62% of black men will have experienced some type of arrest, some type of hostility, some type of confrontation because of image. So the Trevor Martin, the image, is the guy in the hood. It could be me. Now, I've been here for a while. I've been stopped more times, a couple of times, coming from the UCF. I, I stay 10 miles from my house. And I've been stopped with my son, all right? Have to take everything out of my car, and I don't drive no, you know, fancy Chrysler 300 or all this stuff. <laughs> I have a, what, what, what do you call it? What do you, a hoopty? <laughs> yeah, all right, that's what I have. I don't have no Mercedes and all this stuff. But my son and I, we've been, he's, he's, he's 10 years old at a time seven. Stop, taken out, everything taken out, looking at us. We all hemmed up. They say, okay, well, there's nothing here. Just leave us out there. All right. In fact, one report listed me, the image, as being 6'5", 272 pounds. Well, I'm 6'1", and I weighed myself this morning, and I'm 168 pounds. <laughs> I mean, if I was that big, I would be in the NBA for sure. All right. So it represents, Trevor Martin represents the image of the African man. Let's go on a little bit farther. Now, the whole image of the African American man is an issue of dehumanization. Now, let's look at, let's look at these wonderful looking fellas. All right. Everybody knows Mike Tyson. Biting Mike. Right? <laughs> All right. Now, when, you, when people see Mike Tyson, they associate Mike Tyson with everything that is wrong. I know Mike Tyson before, during, and after jail. Eccentric, like most of us are, but he is not the beast 
that, it care, that, that, that the media has characterized. They characterize the average American black male as being a beast, as being scary. If you don't believe me, walk on any street in this city and you talk, you, you have two or three black guys walking on that same sidewalk and you look at some whites, maybe middle class, they will duck into a store, hold their pocketbook tighter, all right, or look for the police, all right, because they associate him as being the black community, the black male as being a rapist, as being a thug, as being criminal, everything that is bad, all right? Mike in the bottom picture, more sedate. He's a Muslim. He tries to do the right thing. Yes, he has problems, but he is not the beast. Let's take another person, Muhammad Ali, standing there with Malcolm X. Now, when he was fluent in his language and really a beautiful boxer, guess what? The majority of America did not like him. They hated him. They said he was brash. He was arrogant. He was a racist. He's a black Muslim terrorist. He's hanging out with a demagogue called Malcolm X. So when people would go see him fight, go look for him to fight, they would root against him. People forget that on one of his comebacks, all right, there, uh, in Georgia, when he was fighting a guy by the name of Jerry Quarry, the governor of Georgia openly stated that he would not be sad if someone assassinated uh, Muhammad Ali. That was in the early 1970s. Then, but he, then as, the, as, a, as a minister for the nation of Islam, he's even more hated at this point. Now people love Muhammad Ali. Why? He can't talk. He's a date. He's not that spokesperson. He's just a, a man who's living out his remaining years. So he's lovable because he's not a threat. All right? That's the reality of things. Now let's go on a little bit farther. All right? Now, stay in your ground law. National Rifle Association. Now, it's, now, we live in Florida, where now Florida is nothing more than Dodge City. Almost everyone has a gun. One day I went to, I went to pray, and I saw a guy that had a pistol in his back pocket, messed up my whole prayer. <laughs> You see, I couldn't, I, I couldn't deal with that. <laughs> you see, so, so uh, you have the act, I can't remember his name now. What's his name? Uh, Charleston, Charleston Hester. Hester. All right. Protect your own. Protect your neighborhood. Protect your country. Protect what? Americanism. Rambo, let's get him. Any means necessary, let's get him. We don't need the police to back us up. You're the enemy, we're gonna shoot you down. Rambo. Then we had the pretty lady. They have guns too. <laughs> All right? And, they <laughs> and she's ready to go to war. So watch out. <laughs> All right? So this is the image of it. Now let's go on a little bit farther in, in, in reference to this. Now what is the stand your ground law? How many of you have really read it? Let's go read it together. All right? Uh, 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 from the statute, chapter 776, justifiable use of force, 776.012. A person is justified in using force except deadly force against another when and the extent that the person reasonably believes that such conduct is necessary to defend him or herself or, any, uh, uh, or another against others' imminent use of, of unlawful force. However, a person is justified in the use of deadly force and does not have a duty to retreat if he or she believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself or another or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. Now, what does that mean? That means that it's up the, the person who feels threatened, he uses his or her thought. It's so broad. Secondly, in reference to Zimmerman, it says nothing about following someone. But they utilize that within his case, that he searches, he seeks, he follows. But this is the law, all right? And it makes it so, 
so vicious and hostile because, again, if you feel threatened, and what is that, what is that can be? Someone says, hello to you, and they're bigger than you, or oh, I'm threatened, bang. You get in an argument with someone, okay, most people have gotten into arguments. We have all gotten into arguments at one time or another. What do we do? I get into an argument with a guy driving. Up yours, up yours, up yours. All right? But we both go the other way. We, we live to see another day. But if he has a gun, he's not going to say up yours, Dr. White. He's going to say, I got this. All right? And I'm going to use it. It's a different thing. Let us go on a little bit farther. All right. So, why is the law? Why do we have this law? Sadly, in Florida, we fear historically African American men as being dangerous. All right? We see an African American man or a dark Latino with pants hanging down, they're dangerous. We see an African American man just kind of walking, taking his time, just going for a stroll. We say he's dangerous because he's looking for a place to break into. We see an African-American man or a person of African descent or a dark-skinned brown person, all right, as just running, doing their own thing, not bothering anyone. He's up to no good. We have these preconceived thoughts in our mind. This goes back over 150 years in our society in Florida. Put in your notes, your mental notes that Florida was one of the most hostile areas, hostile states in reference to African-American rights in our country. Maybe only second to Mississippi. In fact, we had a KKK in, this, in, this, in this Florida that was just as large as the KKK in Mississippi and in Georgia and Louisiana. Let's go on a little bit farther. Oh, no, go back. I'm not finished. Thank you. We're, we're working on this. We're going on the road pretty soon. All right. <laughs> African-American males are 28 more times than white males to be arrested. 28 more times. All right? That's something. Now, if you know this, and even if you're not a policeman, and you feel like you want to cause some problems, you can say, well, I'm going to shoot him, because everyone knows that African-American males are dangerous. Everybody would side with me, and they would understand my fear. It goes on a little bit, which also means that over 80% of the jails in the United States are filled with people of African descent. All right? And it's growing also for, white, uh, for, for black females. This came out in the Equ uh, Equal to, uh, uh, Equally uh, and Human Rights Commission. All right, how about schools? Blacks are three times more likely to be suspended than whites. Office for Civil Rights. All right, U.S. Department of Education. Look around. In our own school, UCF, there is a higher, you, you see far few, one of the smallest student bodies are black males. They're less likely to enter into the university and even less likely to graduate from the university. All right? Look at these numbers. It's not an accident. All right? It's not that they're dumb either. All right, some things are going on. Amnesty International. Um, the World Conference Against Resolution, the U.S. Constitution, all have stated that racial profiling is a human rights uh, violation. And then, and, 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 but, at the, but, at, but during the media coverage of Zimmerman, no media in the United States argued anywhere from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal to the L.A. Times that his human rights was violated, not one. However, if you go across the pond, the London Times, papers in Russia, and uh, late papers in, 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 in the Middle East, all focus on human rights. Why is that? Next one. Because even though we understand what human rights, we really have no one to protect the human rights of the African-American male. It's interesting to note one of the great organizers or to create a philosophy for human rights with the League of Nations and later on with the United Nations was none other than Du Bois, who focused on human rights. But who speaks to this is uh, issue? They hear cases every day 
about human rights violations against people of African descent in the United States. It's not mentioned in the media. No one talks about it. When uh, Kofi Anna spoke about it some time ago, they, 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 they looked at him like he was a buffoon, basically saying that, just stick with Africa and those types of issues. Let's go on. Now, I don't know if you can pull this up. Now, when, 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 when this issue hit the community, the local media didn't take much part of it. They didn't look at it deep. It was only when, oh, uh, you can't pull that up? OK. It was, it was only when Michael Baston and Tom Joyner started to talk about the whole Trevor Martin thing. Now, I'm not a big fan of Michael Basin. He's a DJ, a radio guy. Nor Tom Joyner, last at anything. All right, because they're not real civil rights activists. They're nothing more but entertainers. But this, this see, can we listen to some of the things that he said that began to create some movement and some channel in reference to this issue on, uh, on human rights. The only major paper that was black to deal with this issue was the Final Call newspaper, the largest black newspaper in the country. All right? Most didn't, do it, didn't deal with anything. I have a whole issue about uh, the black media, uh, how they handle things and uh, real, real issues. In fact, this is not the, 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 uh, the remembrance of 9-11. Uh, I remember when 9-11 hit, and um, I was flipping through the channel, CNN, C-SPAN, and so on. Uh, okay, put it on. Just be quiet, everyone. Okay, let's go on. You don't have to do the second one. Basically, it's just making, it, it struck a core in black America. All right, it struck a core. And, and, and that um, a lot of people felt what was, felt the pain of Zimmerman because they lived that experience. But again, the local media did hardly anything uh, before, uh, before the national media uh, stated something. In fact, the Orlando Sentinel, the first articles on it, looked upon George Zimmerman in a very favorable way. Now, the local leaders, the national leaders come on scene. Now, who are the national leaders? Jesse, <laughs> Sharpton, Big Al, and Ben Jealous. And who are these cats? Well, let's look at it quickly. The Jesse that came to Sanford was not the Jesse of old. All right, the Jesse of old, the man who stood with King as he, uh, uh, on the Lorraine Hotel uh, balcony when he was shot. The Jesse who helped to operate and develop Operation Breadbasket, Rainbow Coalition. That was a grassroots Jesse. When he came here, he was basically a moderate Jesse, speaking more for the establishment. That Jesse that came here is so enrooted with the Coca-Cola <laughs> right, industry where he has been able to finance himself and his family. So he speaks more in moderate tones. Now, if you don't know this, you say, oh, wow, Jesse is fired up. He's a militant. You know, he's no more militant than my little poodle home. <laughs> All right? A transformation. Let's go on. Big Al. Who was Al? How many of you know that Al Sharpton's stepfather was James Brown? All right? James Brown took him in. All right? 
That's why he had that long hair for a long time. He said he would not cut his hair or, or uh, stop straightening his hair until James Brown died. But the James, but the Al Sharpton we saw during these periods, during this period, young firebrand minister activist out of the Bronx, in Brooklyn, Long Island, throughout the country, the same one who would take up a cause that represented the plight of the black community anytime. That, that Al Sharpton is not the one that came. The one that came is the one who works for MSNBC. The one who really now is no more than a spokesperson for the Democratic Party. The one that MSNBC just recently made a, a, a millionaire. So he speaks on a moderate tone, a conditioned tone. Let's go on. Benjamin Jealous, a guy who never understood the civil rights movement, never was brought up in the civil rights movement, so doesn't really have an understanding and a platform and a, a, and a pedigree to lead a march or to develop a march. So he's just coming in by what he sees others, a moderate tone. Let's go on a little bit farther. Now, to, to understand this moderate tone is that Jesse, Sharpton nor Jealous did the basic thing, the mainstay of a civil rights movement and a civil rights march. And what is that? A boycott. Al Sharp, I mean, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, because they understand that there's only one thing that America understands if you want to change things, and that's the pocketbook. That issue was never brought up. Never. Now, now why is all of this? Because for, since the early 1960s, the government has always wanted to find a way to handle and tone down civil rights and human rights activism in the United States. First one, see that good looking guy with the gun? That's J. Edgar Hoover, all right? Who targeted organizations that he saw as being un-American, civil rights organizations, and human rights organizations to him were un-American. So in the early 60s, he created something called the Counterintelligence Program, COINTEL Profiles, to discredit leaders and to discredit organizations and to prevent the rise of major leaders. Four people he was focusing on in the, mid, in the early to mid-60s. Four. One, Malcolm X. Got him. Martin Luther King, got him. Stokely Carmichael, later on, he would die. All right? Elijah Muhammad, old man, he would die. Got rid of them. Discredit them. But something comes up, too, that people don't understand. What comes up after this? There's a new program, a 1964 Civil Rights Act, something called the Department of Justice Community Relations Service. The Community Relations Service. Now, there was a group called Peacemakers. How many of you ever heard of that? All right, a couple of people. Peacemakers. You may see them. They walk around and they're like, uh, uh, like uh, what do you call uh, Windbreakers, nice baseball cap, sunglasses. You always know federal officers, don't you? <laughs> All, right. All right, they walk around. And, but what they do, they interject themselves into the movement. Let's go on a little bit farther. All right. Now, when the Orlando Sentinel started to pick up that about something about the peacemakers, they said, quote, when racial tension flared in Sanford, a league of secretive peacemakers reached out to the city's spiritual and civil rights, civic leaders to help cool emotions after 17-year-old Martin was killed in February. All right. When civil rights organizers wanted to demonstrate these federal workers taught them how to peacefully manage crowds. They even arranged police escort for college students to ensure safe passage, etc. The point is, is that the peacemakers ultimately, through the Department of Justice, developed the objective, the momentum, and the direction of the movement. Right there. The larger crowd did not realize this. Now, that, that, that's, that, no, no, Dr. White, prove your point. I will in a second. All right, let's go on a little bit farther. All right. 
Now, how do you prove your point? The first night, I took my class to, um, to, to the valley, to the church, Allen Chapel. All right. They had Al and Justice and some of the others in the church. They was really preaching up a storm. We got a vote. <laughs> All right. 200 people in there. Check this out. Over 2,000 young people were outside the church. They weren't listening to what Al and Jesse and the youth cast were saying. They wanted momentum. They wanted action. Because they got tired of listening to the same thing. They, which the media didn't pick up, had a spontaneous march onto the police, de sta police station. First time I ever saw where policemen were afraid to come out. Of their, own, of their own headquarters. They were there, held up traffic and everything. They wanted action. But the peacemakers, along with the so-called moderate leadership, kept one thing alive. One, a slogan, no justice, no peace. And two, we just want our best. But the people wanted more. That's grassroots movement, grassroots activism. But the peacemakers and the others suppressed it. Valerie Houston, she may be a good person, but just misguided. All right? She says, they are the ears and, uh, eyes and ears of the community and will guide us and direct the movement for its best interest, best success. That's her words. Giving the power of the people to a government force. Now, this is like years ago, if you ever take my class on labor history, years ago, when, when, when owners of corporations did not want a union, they would create what? A floor union. You ever heard of that? A floor union, whereby they would pick the leaders of the union and they would negotiate. They would decide what you wanted. This is the same thing. All right, let's go on a little bit farther. All right? As I stated, the leaders never called for a boycott which is the mainstay of any civil rights, human rights movement. All right? Now, let us go on. Now, when other people started to call for a boycott, what did you do? You maligned them, and you made them look crazy. Here, the Revolutionary Black Panther Party, the only thing that came out in the media about them is that, oh, they, and along with the new Black Panther Party, want to put out a... Uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a bounty of ten or $12,000. Hell, they don't even have that much money. <laughs> I know them. They're just talking. All right? Now, if you are afraid of them, just look at historically again. The Black Panther Party, the old and the new and the revolutionary, has no history of attacking whites. None. If you find it, tell me. Show me. There's no history of them destroying the property of other people. None. There's no history of them having a hatred. They follow an idea of economics, of an economic philosophy. But here, if you don't know, if you're a black person in the community, you say, oh, I don't want to go out there. Them Black Panthers, they're going to kill somebody. Ooh. If you're white, uh-uh, uh-uh. If they come after me, I... I I get my thing. I click them. I, I shoot them off. You had this type of thing brewing. Media hype. And we all fell into it. As Malcolm would say, we were all bamboozled, hooked, <laughs> led astray. <laughs> Look at that. All right. So when they started, they were the ones who called for a boycott. But no one followed them because, ooh, they are dangerous. All right. Let's go on a second. All right. So let's go a little bit farther. The protest. All right. The protest. When, when, when Charlton and the others spoke in one of the last days of the uh, movement, and I say one of the last days because nothing has come out since. All right. But pay for, but pay for the city. All right. To have a rally on their property. That's, that, that means you're conditioned. You're being controlled. The San Francisco Municipal Park paid by the city. How can you have a movement for the people when, you, when, when, when a so-called oppressor 
is, is, is financing you. That, that doesn't make any sense. Then the peacemakers influence the leaders of the, of, the, of the Sanford movement not to invite certain people. Malana Kaminga, a friend of mine, professor in California. How many of you practice Kwanzaa or have heard of Kwanzaa? Handful of you. All right. The founder of Kwanzaa. He wanted to come. No invite, wouldn't even talk to him. Angela Davis, bad professor, tough, hardcore, straight, one of the great people of the Black Panthers uh, in the 1960s, brilliantly analytical, wanted to come. No invite. Farrakhan, they were scared to death of him. All right, he wanted to come. They said, hell no. <laughs> All right? People who can galvanize and create a momentum, all right, and, and raise the right questions about the whole issue of race and human rights were not given an invite to come. So therefore, you got a milk toast movement. Now let's go on a little bit farther. All right? Now, let's go on. Um, what do you call it? The memorial. Let's say monument. The memorial taken down. Say they're going to put it in a mu museum. Has it, have, have you seen it in a museum yet? <laughs> all right. Now, I've, I've been living here for nine years. They have memorials all over the city, all over central Florida. Somebody gets shot, somebody gets hit by a car. The memorials stay up there, what, for years. All of a sudden, it's taken down. Why? They want to wipe it from the memory of the people. So you won't have no connection to it. If it's not in your memory, if it's not in your consciousness, there's no movement, right? There's none. Let's go on a little bit farther. All right, new judge, third one. Most of you don't even realize it because it has been gradually taken from you. Movement has taken place. Zimmerman is out. He has raised not 300, 400,000, as I said, over a million dollars. He has now become the hero of the stand your ground law throughout the country. Um, I have a friend who teaches at uh, university, uh, I mean Ohio State University, and they have posters, people put posters of him as a hero on campus. All right, it's taking place throughout the country. That's why he's smiling, I would be smiling too. All right, let's go a little bit farther. All right, here, Zimmerman, his uh, sudden, uh, people are setting targets domestically and internationally of Martin. How many of you know this? And guess where they're made at? Ah, not even 10 miles from where you're sitting. All right? Making targets. What is it really saying? It's really saying that the black male is dangerous and you have the right to shoot him. No questions asked. This is the type of environment that we're living under and what has taken place. Let's go on. Try to finish up quickly. So, What's the conclusion? Zimmerman's school records are sealed. Don't, don't go back to asking him what he did. But Martins are soon to be released. Most of us don't even realize that. His character assassinated. Oh, he, he smoked herb. Well, Bill Clinton did too. He's not in jail. <laughs> uh, OK. All right. Or, or uh, he, he was suspended. So what? Has nothing to do with anything. It's off the radar. Black and white mediums not even talking about it. It's gone. You know, Michael Basin, Tom Jordan, they're talking about who's loving who. Now, nothing else. Race intimidation continues as normal. I'll take some questions. I have... All right, thank you very much. I think that's it. Oh. They, they, they tell me that the one who asked the most analytical and uh, breathtaking question or statement gets one of these, right? But I'm not going to choose. They're not going to pick at my house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions? Did I make any sense? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you're talking about uh, boycotting? What would you boycott in this situation? What would, you, what would your target be? You boycott the businesses. Every, every um, because remember, Sanford, like Florida, is a tourist industry. So therefore, you, you boycott 
um, major hotels, uh, eateries, maybe even the mall. All right. Even if you change, if you change their bottom line by five or ten percent, that's a great statement. And um, I'll tell you how powerful this was. In the 1990s, groups like the Urban League, National Urban League, and the NAACP, when they had an issue with a particular town on, a, or on something, they would boycott. And normally, the city council, the mayors, would try to work out that issue because they didn't want that city to lose any money. All right? So if you're just going to just rally and say all day, no justice, no peace, and, and you know, and get Zimmerman, it means nothing. It's a, it becomes nothing more than a pep rally. I mean, after a pep rally, you want to see the team play. All right, that. Yes, I saw another hand. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, if you were to change the standard ground law, like, how would you adjust it? I wouldn't have no standard ground law. I think, I think standard ground law, first, I mean, I don't believe in weapons. I mean, I, I've been to over 30 countries, been in some of the toughest areas. I was one of the first professors to go to the Sudan when they, when they were in the Civil War. All right? I've been chased by people in various African countries because they say, oh, that's a dirty American. I don't need a weapon. All right? I don't believe in weapons. All right? I, I believe that when one or more people have a weapon, then you create an environment for death. You see, so it shouldn't be. I think the only ones who should have weapons are the police, and we should train them uh, to, to be more culturally aware and more civil and, and more proactive in their handling of people. Because, I mean, uh, last year I gave a paper at the Human Rights um, Conference at Georgetown. And one of the things I talked about in which they agreed that right now, uh, Florida, Central Florida, has become one of the most dangerous places in the country because of the use of weapons. Everybody has a weapon. So I don't think we need it at all. Yes. Um, aside from weapon use, you mentioned that um, Florida is one of the most hostile places yeah. culturally. Uh, is there something specific in Floridian history that you think makes it that way compared to, say, other like Georgia or the Carolinas? I think that our lawmakers have not been very assertive in speaking to the truth and the needs of the people. I mean, for example, you have, and, and it's on both sides, white and black and, uh, and Latino. I mean, you have a guy named, uh, locally, um, Gary Sipling, right? Um, let's see, part of the state rep. Now, he, he pushes through a measure that says, well, if you wear baggy pants, you can be stopped and you can be uh, cited as, and be given a misdemeanor charge, a fine or jail time, misdemeanor though. Well, that type of law makes no sense. That helps to profile people. If you don't like them, you don't like how they wear, okay, you don't like it. That should be the church or there's some institution to deal with, a home to deal with them, all right? But he, he has these types of laws, they, they, he, he pushes it all like that for his own political purpose. We have to start getting people to push measures that are good for society, not just because they want to be reelected or elected. You see, so the problem is the, the politicians to me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a question. What do you think, as, as a people, black people in general, I think that maybe we could be making other contributions to, to cause a, maybe a better movement or to, to ignite a change in, within our own people and then you know that could spread to different whatever. What do you think could be done where we are? Because you have to kind of have politicians. You kind of have to play both sides of the field. So what do you, I mean, you have to compromise. There has to be a little bit of both for it to be successful. Well, let's, let's look at that. Um, Martin Luther King wasn't a politician. Um, there, there, weren't, there weren't many black politicians at the time. Adam Clayton Powell uh, was one of the best. Um, I believe that grassroots activism create change at the best, all right? They, they force measures to take place. They force things to take place. But if you just, if you just follow a simple line that everyone else follows. You vote, 
to get the right person. Well, that doesn't work all the time. You think it works. If that was to, if it works so well, we would be farther along. It doesn't work all that way. One more. Yeah. Okay, so Martin Luther King was a centralized leader. He was somebody that was almost like self-elected by black people to represent us. But he worked hand in hand with politicians, even though he wasn't one. He had the degrees and the pedigree. He had everything that he needed to be in the place to talk to the people that could do something. He realized that he there was very limited things that he could do. He had to work with politicians. Yeah. There had to be like what? So okay, Martin Luther King then. Who now? Yeah. Let's just examine Martin Luther King a second. How many of you know that Martin Luther King came here in 63, 64 after the March on Washington? He spoke at Tinkerfield. Politicians did not endorse him. The media ignored him. Black ministers said that he was dangerous, get out of town. All right? Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and those others, they understood that it was the grassroots, the people make things happen. All right. Um, yes, you do need some good politicians, but to put a whole lot, to put your put all your eggs in that basket as well. Now, where does it come? The new leadership. It comes from people like you. All right. It comes from people who who you are young. I mean, I'm I'm out. I'm 54. I'm going to watch all of this. All right. You you. It comes from you all. All right. Who's going? You have to be courageous. All right? You have to be, what did I tell my class? You have to be a, what, an intellectual what? Gangster. You have to be, <laughs> you, you have to be a thug intellectually. There's no hose bar. All right? So if you're willing to speak truth, be forceful, straight, then you can be that person, that group that, that can make change. But if you, are, if, you, if you walk out with the idea, I got to negotiate, I have to go to this little party, and I have to eat hors d'oeuvres with them, nothing's ever going to take place. It can't work that way. You, you negotiate from strength. You show a hard right first. All right? Then when they calm down, then you can unleash, you know, open your fist. Yes, sir. Did I get to you? Do you think that the capitalist system as a whole makes it difficult to be an activist? You know, because like you gave examples of Jesse Jackson and Reverend Al Sharpton going from militant to moderate. And I've also noticed that that's a challenge that seems to be a major critique in the LGBT community is yeah. that, you know, gay activism is gay consumption, essentially. Right, right. And like you were talking about boycotts and whatnot, people. Like I've heard criticisms of, of contemporary universities educating students today to be consumers, not, not critical thinkers. Yes. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. You're right. It does make it difficult because, I mean, uh, a lot of times when I give these talks, people okay, would tell me, hey, it's a capitalist system. It's about money. It's about making money. That really tells me they don't understand the capitalist system. All right? Because for most of us, most of us will not make the money as they think that it's utilized to channel this fuel called capitalism. Most of us are nothing more than proletarians. We're just workers, all right? They, they get us to believe that we are something. So what do we do? Oh, we go to, we go to the mall and buy fake, fake fur. We, buy, we go get a used Mercedes, or we made it. We take a little trip, think that, oh, we have something. We buy a house thinking that that's real wealth, all right? We are believed into these things to such, a, to such a, 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 a point that we become, in one manuscript, I say that we become managers for the capitalist system. We manage the capitalist system for the, for the real powers because we suppress our own and suppress the other people. So we have to have, we need to have classes and professors and, 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 and student teachers to give a real story, give a real review of capitalism, how it works, how it can be beneficial, and how it can be reacted to when it, when it goes against the words and the needs of the people. Yeah. Um, we went over the Stand Your Ground law in this little seminar, and you stated some of the contradictions that George Emerson did. How then did they actually? justify his actions if he had a contradiction stated inside the law in the first place. 
that what? was confusing to me. It, 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 was, it was a... Uh, a paradox. And that is, I mean, when, when it happened, one police wanted to arrest him, the other one didn't. Uh, the chief of police sided with uh, Zimmerman. All right, the law is so broad, all right, that um, you could uh, interpret it how you want it to be. But if we looked at the issue of just human rights, just a basic, basic issue of human rights, there's no way that man should have been allowed to go more than you know, go so long without being arrested. I'll put it this way. You, if, if, if someone in this room accused you of hitting them, even if you didn't, and they called the police, guess what? You're handcuffed. Simple as that, all right? If you go to the store downstairs, it's still a so-called walk out with a candy bar, and say you forgot to pay for it, you're apprehended. Now you have a man who was killed, Put it this way, the life now among people of African descent is so, is so cheap, you get more time for killing a dog, all right, than for killing a, another individual, another human being. That's, and, that, and that's another problem because right now, right now the African American community, really, like it or not, has become obsolete in this society. And that's another discussion. Can I add something before you move on? Yes. Because on that topic, if you think back at the images that came out of the arrest of George Zimmerman, one of the most striking images <coughs> for me is that when George Zimmerman arrived at the police station, <coughs> they opened the doors to the police car and they allowed him to walk out. He was handcuffed, but the police officers walked in ahead of him. Mm -hmm. And he just sort of like sauntered in on his own. And from experience, I know that with that person who had been handcuffed had been African-American or uh, Puerto Rican in this community, or he wouldn't have been walking in on his own. He would have had two officers grabbing him strongly on his side. Pushing him. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, this man right behind you, then you. No, you, you in the yellow. Yeah, then the lady with the, with the, the lady with the dreads. Yeah. Talked about, um, like, the militant order, like, being militant as opposed to being uh, in the middle. I just wonder why, and maybe this is just a falsity of the media that again I bought into because who knows, um, why did his family say through their attorney that the Martin family say through their attorney that they didn't support the, um, the new Black Panthers group or their stance on that. Like you said, they didn't have $10,000 so it's not a literal sense, you know, um, it's more of a modality but it's like what is, do you see what I mean, like why, is it because they're being tonal? And That's not right. militant enough? That's or? Right. Uh, what's <laughs> happening is that the Martin family, I mean, they're not a very educated family. They're nice people. All right, they don't read. So they bought right into the whole concept again of what the media said what this group is all about. So therefore, they're, they're, they're violence, and they kept on saying, we don't want no violence. Again, there's no history in this country of African-American people being violent in that manner towards the larger white community. But, but they, kept, they bought into it, so it became their reality. You see, I mean, I, I, I remember I, I spoke to a group of professors about the same thing. And one professor, you know, if you didn't know me, she, she talked to me as if I had an Uzi in my jacket or something. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're mean, you're military, you would have killed me. That's not about that. All right? It's the idea. And once that reality is there, it's hard for people to take it, take it out. Yes, ma'am. Then I get back to you. I have two. Um, the first one is more of a comment or a question. Um, do you believe that? Do you agree that the dehumanization of the black male is sort of like a continuum from slavery when they posed um, black males as being grotesque and used um, terms such as zip coon, and then um, women being as like sexual beings, and then then now we see them as still seeing black males as being grotesque or wearing their pants down or not having any kind of... Sure. It comes from slavery. Um, the, the, the black male has been looked upon as in two ways. One as being that beast, and then the second one as being this sexual monster. Now, there's a movie, some of you guys who Doc knows, about J.D. Revenge, right? Now, it's not no porn movie. It's not no... All right, but here you have you have JD's revenge, right? JD is tell me if I'm getting it right. He's in jail. 
He's in jail for a crime he didn't do. They do an experiment on him, right? And, and for him to get out of jail, he had to allow for this experiment to take place. So he's out of jail now. And he realizes that when he gets mad, his penis grows, right? So, so he sees these white people who put him in jail for a crime he didn't do. So across the, across the, uh, the screen, you see this big black penis growing. <laughs> All right? Wraps himself around the neck of somebody. And a poor white man <laughs> doing this type of thing. All right? The whole story now, what it is, is that the black male is either a brute or a sexual beast. I remember I was young once. And I remember I was a park ranger. It just stays in this room. <laughs> and, 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 and my, my colleagues, they're in the country, and they kind of country, they wanted to do skinny dipping. They taking off their clothes, jumping in the water, and I didn't take off my clothes, and they kept on saying, come on, Vibert, we want to see if it's true what they say about you black guys. You know? The thing, brute sexual thing, all right? Woman, female the same way. I mean, it wouldn't be until the mid-70s that a white man was, the first white man was convicted of the rape of a black woman, until the 1970s, all right? And, it's, and, 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 it's, and in slavery, they said, uh, women, black women, they begin to have babies. They begin to have babies when they're 12 and 13 because that's their nature. You can't, you can't rape them because they like it. That's their way. So therefore, I mean, the, the, the black woman is looked upon as being a sexual, dysfunctional being. That's still there. Yes. So this, you would say this validates, would you say that this validates the actions that are committed against the African-American male or one of the females? Both. I mean, yeah, it's, it's part of all of that. All right, that uh, both, both, both genders within the black community are victimized by this. And the sad part about it is that the black community oftentimes buys into this stuff. We begin to believe it ourselves. And that's when a peep, that's when uh, a people, as Bob Marley would say, have become conditioned. When you're conditioned, you think whatever they say is right. I think one more question. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I have two questions because I'm from Canada, yes. and this is all really interesting to me. But there's two things. If I see anyone with their butt hanging out in their pants, I don't like it. Yeah. My son had to be. I don't want to see your underwear. I don't think I'm prejudiced about anybody. I just don't like it, and that's my opinion. And when I heard about the shooting, because I don't believe in guns either, I kind of you're not allowed to. My whole thing was I didn't want to go to Sanford. I didn't want to be caught in this whole controversy of unfairness. And I didn't hear a true representation really of anybody for quite a while. Yeah, it was awful what happened to a child just walking. I have three children. That would have been awful. That could have been my son. I don't care what color he is. That could have been my son. The other thing is I don't know that much about George Zimmerman and either, except what I've heard from the media from him lying in court him gain all this money. The thing is, it's really hurting Sanford and the good people in Sanford that didn't walk that night or didn't do anything. What I don't understand about grassroots is you want to make a good point and you want it fair. But sir, when you go and you tell people to boycott, you're not hurting perhaps the people who are being unjust or prejudiced or unfair. Maybe I'm very naive in my thought pattern here. Are you not just hurting the entire population? Well, boycotting this is, a, is as American as apple pie. For example, when we, when we say that we don't like Castro, we close everything. We don't care about the poor people and the hungry people in Havana or Santiago de Cuba. Right. All right? When we say that we don't want to, um, when we don't like the leader of North Korea, we boycott. We, 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 we block things. So if we do it internationally, 
and we do it frequently. Oh, I see. The, that's that the same right here. All right. Surely you don't want no one to hurt, right. but if they begin to feel the pinch a little bit, all right, they may say, "Hey, listen, let's review something. Let's review some policies." If you t if you just take on a notion of doing nothing, then it just again it just becomes a pet rally, and after a while it goes down, like not like like now. The, the, the issue is the, the case is still there, the issues are still there, but it's not on anyone's radar. It's almost like it happened 10 years ago now. So how long would you suggest something like that continue? Until, until the point is made. And, <laughs> you see, until, until they change policy. So don't you think the point's made? And uh, I'm not no. trying to be ignorant. I mean, I mean for example. For I, this particular case, it's gotten yeah. national attention. It's, it's international attention. People are asking me about it because I do live in Orlando. Is that not been made? I don't think so. Uh, I think the issue is still going on. Nothing has been resolved. Um, and it looks like right now when I read the, course, uh, the court files, it looks like uh, Zimmerman has one hand up. All right? And it looks like he, if he, does, if he is sentenced, it may be something that may be so minute that it would be a travesty. I think this lady first, didn't you? It was actually in response that the, the issue isn't Zimmerman himself. The issue is the institution and the way that, that the entire thing was handled by the entire community. So the issue isn't was Zimmerman guilty or not. The issue is how this entire thing was handled. So. Mm -hmm. I know he's famous now, and it's for a bad thing, but why would the government allow him to like get so much money and pretty much bail himself out? And like now I hear he's trying to leave it. the state of Florida until the trial starts. <laughs> is that right? Like is that is that like it's I, business? I don't know, it's, it's, legal, legal, right? it's legally. Um, I mean morally, yeah, not, not so. But I mean we we do like gentlemen said. We, one thing about a capitalism, you can't stop anyone from making money, um, and and getting legal fees. The the, the travesty of it is that. Um, he has become such a hero in that line. Now, let's take this one last question, Mr. Lee. Do you think that capitalism is, is um, a major contribution to the reason there isn't as much movement? Because um, the funding, you know, just like we, we don't, we, we need black people to, to do their own thing and to, to be a part of, be a, in charge of the movement for themselves. But I'm wondering now what caused the deterioration from then to now to begin with? Is it capitalism? Was it, is it funding? What, what, was the, what was the deterioration and what's the solution? What I think our interpretation of capitalism, uh, for example, African American people have always realized that this is a, a monetary system where people are struggle and strive to become better off financially. Um, but we misinterpret it. For example, in 19, at the turn of the century, there was something like seven black banks in the United States, black. Now we may have three, all right? At the turn of the century, we had a number of blacks owning hundreds of thousands of acres of land. Right now, blacks own less than 1% of the land in the United States, all right? Right now, if it wasn't for African Americans, General Motors wouldn't be alive. We buy more Cadillacs than anything else in any people. We buy, we, 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 you know, dry cleaning. We're the number one people who use dry cleaners. All right, those types of things. Um, we, the African American people, by itself, by itself, by themselves, represents the seventh wealthiest nation in the world. Our interpretation, you have wealth, but not understanding how to use it and how to make it a powerful arsenal in your, in your fight for freedom, justice, and equality. What's the solution? How do you fix that? The interpretation, all right? Learn how to utilize money. Having uh, scholars, professors, ministers to talk about it, all right? And how to gather real wealth. For example, I mean, I, I, I don't have much money. Professors don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
but 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 I but I I was able, God bless me that I was able to buy ten acres of land up north. I would utilize that land to build wealth, as opposed to using that money I had to buy a new car, all right, or to take some unneeded, lavish vacation for three months or something, all right? How we utilize it? We have to build wealth, just like, just like every other community, the Jewish community, various Latin American communities, the Asian communities, they're building wealth like crazy, all right? And, and right now, the black community throughout the world is looked upon, if you want to make money, Take your idea to the black community. They'll buy anything. They're the nipple of the world. All right? So it's a re you have to rethink. Rethink yourself. Yeah, yes. The statement that part of, part of how capitalism has, to a certain extent, undermined um, our, our grassroots efforts is that we are no longer a common community. We don't have. Um, goals in common, and therefore we're not That's moving. Awesome. And and and, and it, it's very it's been a very systematic thing where um, we think about our individual needs, right. not the needs right. of the community, mm -hmm. as opposed to in right. the first part of the 20th century, we were told we were significantly focused on the needs of the community, and that's what you heard about. That's not what you hear about anymore. And so that's where you start to see the, in, in the fracturing of the community's needs, you also, in the, in the rise of individualization, that's where you also see, okay, th this is not my problem. <laughs> and so the grassroots is that much more difficult to mobilize as a result. Yeah, and, and, and I know we have to go, but um, I just want to say in answer to the young man's question, understand the system. Because what happens is, when I went to college, and that's years and years ago, uh, I had to study world history, American history. All you guys to graduate, you got to study what? History. So you need to learn the history, and if you learn the history, then you'll understand what we're talking about. And the question that you ask in terms of that, if you understand the history of it, you'll understand why it's not fair. He just talked about it in his speech earlier today. He gave some facts and stuff in terms of what happened right here in Florida, in Okoye, in this place. You guys know this campus, okay, itself. We live right next to Bithlo. So okay, so you learn this history, learn what Bithlo is, and Christmas late at night, okay, or in daytime, okay. So, I mean, it's a little better now, but I mean, learn where you live and learn what's going on. So, in terms of studying that, world history, uh, uh, American history that you were forced to learn in high school and you get it again in college. Mm -hmm. Learn African American history, learn black history, learn Africana history. Learn that system that puts you in the position that what, what uh, Dr. White is talking about in terms of why they have this perception of us. And what can you do about it? <laughs> that movement that he's talking about, that militancy that he's talking about, were students in college, your age. You guys got the power. It's not us old dudes. It's you guys. All of those movements were started by college students. Find out he had up there uh, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, the Black Panthers. These weren't old folks. <laughs> the Freedom Riders. These were all guys your age. So you don't have to say, well, one leader here and one leader there. And Martin Luther King wouldn't have been a leader had it not been for your young folks behind him because they had his back. But he wouldn't have been a leader without Malcolm X either. Right. So understand that just a position because everybody went over here because he said, oh, let him hit you, let him spit on you, don't do anything. Whereas Malcolm said, if you spit on me, I'm going to spit back. <laughs> okay, so understand that why He's in the history department, and what he's trying to teach all of you guys so that you understand that you can think for yourself, and you become the new thing. And it can get started with one person, two people, three people. Doesn't have to be a whole mass of you. Once that thing starts, it starts. And the women in here who've heard me talk before, you know I said to you, start a revolution at UCF about these pants. 
You can do it tomorrow. Just stop talking to any boy that comes to you got his pants hanging. <laughs> I guarantee you them pants will come up tomorrow. <laughs> Just say, I'm not talking to you till you pull your pants. I don't want to see your underwear. Women started on the campus of UCF, it'll spread the nation. Trust me. <laughs> so you don't have to depend on a law. You don't have to, do, you do it yourself. Anyway, that's, thank you, sir. <laughs>